Hello and welcome to the Fifty Shades of Gender podcast. We get curious about all things gender, sex and sexuality, as well as relationships, feminism, the inclusive kind, mental health and kink, and all that makes us humans unique and diverse. From body positivity to body dysmorphia, it's all welcome here. Come with us on a journey of inclusion, acceptance and respect. I'm your host, Esther Lemons. I identify as a cisgender woman and my pronouns are she and her. In this episode, I'm speaking to Ella Zora, an artist from London who epicenters her work on classics, binarism and horses. Ella's pronouns are she, her or they, them. She identifies as a transgender woman and is an anti-intersex genital mutilation activist. Find out what that means to Ella in this episode. We also talk about the roots of the word hermaphrodite, how the gender critical movement is far from new, Hippocrates as a gender critical pioneer, the blatant suppression and erasure of transgender and intersex gods and human beings in art history and modern museums, and how history is starting to be unmasked. Please be aware we talk about the myth of Sibylle and Ectistis, in which there is mention of castration. Ella describes a painting called Hippocratic Corpus Gender Hierarchy. You can see it on the website. It was recorded on the 13th of November 2020. Now let's get into the episode. Hello and welcome. What's your name? Hi there. Um, my name's Ella Zora. And how do you identify, Ella? Um, I identify that I'm transgender and a trans woman. I feel I've always felt like I'm a girl in a boy's body, to put it like that. That's, that's how I felt growing up, if I'm really honest. I know that mm. offends certain people by saying that, particularly people who are gender critical. But that's the truth. If I didn't say that, then I would be lying. Mm-hmm. And I feel like my pronouns are she or they, but mm-hmm. I definitely feel like I was born with sort of my head sort of towards female and my feet towards male. Mm-hmm. And I feel sort of a combination of both. There is a sort of sense of androgyny there for definite. I wouldn't be able to lie about that, but mm-hmm. I definitely feel much more feminine, much more girl and female, not just in my sexuality, but also my mannerisms, the way I walk, the way I talk, everything. It's, I'm just naturally more female than male in my gender, yet my body isn't that. So I'm sort of transgender, but I'm also having mm-hmm. tests at the moment. I've had two tests already. I've had a chromosome test that showed that I've got XY chromosomes, but that doesn't mean that I'm not in sex at other levels. So I wanted to do other tests and see if I've got any sort of insect biology that Mm -hmm. is detectable and the reason why in a way i've come to that decision that i wanted to find out if i am in sex at any biological level is because i've got friends that actually have had tests and they found that they were intersex Mm -hmm. either in uh, their chromosomes their hormones their gonads internally that they didn't realize they even had their genitals on the outside this is a complete spectrum of biological possibilities of how we can be wired beyond this black, white, male, female binary that we've all been educated to believe. Mm. So that's why I'm curious because I wasn't brought up to be like this. You know, my mum and dad didn't say, right, this is someone we're going to dress up as a girl every day and forced to be a girl when really they're a boy. It didn't work like that at all. In fact, the opposite, you know, my family were telling me to, to get out of the girl clothes when I was little. My mum would find me in the wardrobe and be like, right, darling, come on, get out. You're being silly, you know. Um, but right. I felt naturally magnetised towards the female role from the beginning. And, you know, I've actually got friends who have been as well, like, you know, in the same way of, as, as I have been, magnetised towards the opposite gender to what they felt they were born on the outside and how they were assigned at birth. Mm. Um, the role, the, the gender roles and the, the, the gender they were put into this binary boxing um, malarkey. And when they went through these tests, they found like, for example, I've got a friend who felt like a girl trapped in a boy's body all her life, mm-hmm. went to the doctors, they did internal scans inside and she's got full working uterus um, and ovaries and she's been having menstruation cycles all throughout her life. So she was having cramps, thinking something was really wrong all her, throughout her life, that she had cancer or something. Mm. And actually, she was a an intersex woman from the inside out. And that's something which the media, you know, religious organisations, the educational syllabus as a whole doesn't tell us or hasn't been telling us until now. So that's why you guys are here. I'm here, you know, because obviously this whole beyond the binary 
conversations mm. that are happening right now in our society are also, I think, freeing humanity mm-hmm. from the lie that they've had to live all throughout their lives. And in a way, science is so important as a kind of intrinsic part of that liberation because it gives us the proof that the biology for the human race isn't black white. Mm. Uh, and so that's where I'm at right now in my art uh, and my art exhibitions. And also, I guess, trying to discover who I am really as well through science. Mm. I read that you're quite the the expert in trans and intersex art history and I wondered what what did you find most surprising about learning about that subject? Well I I mean I'm an expert I wouldn't say I'm an expert what I am is Mm -hmm. very passionate about the subject and I'm an artist that needs to draw in inspirations to create my artworks Mm -hmm. and I'm obsessed with the subject because I grew up in a world in a society that told me that someone like me has never existed before and that Mm. me coming along and being the way I am and dressing in the way that is natural and visceral to me Mm -hmm. uh, was sort of wrong or an embarrassment or a joke and that I was an ignominy. So when I started to look at our history in the West alone, in Western Europe, I started to discover immediately simply by words that were used in antiquity, that there was a lot in our past that has been masked and hidden away from us on purpose in museums, in the educational syllabus. And so I really came to this area of classics, you know, the transgender and intersex history aspects of classics because of one particular word, and that was the word hermaphrodite. It was a Mm -hmm. word which some people around me in the LGBT community really loved and were reclaiming. And then on the other side of the coin, there was lots of other people who were saying, no, this is a horrible word. We don't want to use it. It's stigmatizing. So I just thought to myself, okay, look, this word exists. So I want to look at the history of this word alone just to start. Mm. And so the etymology of the word led me to discovering the intersex God, who was also considered a transgender God because the word hermaphrodite links to the Greek and Roman god Hermaphroditus, who is an evolved figure, really, from a Cypriot intersex god called Aphroditus. And when I realised that immediately just that in itself, that history existed, that there was this god called Hermaphrodite and that there was another god before them in Cyprus called Aphroditus and that they were seen as a sort of parallel version to Aphrodite as her sort of androgynous version almost mm. and that they were depicted in statues naked sometimes with their clothes being lifted up to reveal their intersex genitals and that that exposure of intersex genitals in that statue form was seen as apotropaic. So that meant, uh, what it means is apotropaic means sort of warding off of evil influences, something that was mm. healing almost, you know, mm. and, and warding away of, of evil forces. So I thought, okay, look, this is just so amazing and fascinating because not only am I living out who I've always felt that I really am. And not only am I looking around me now at society and seeing that there's other people like me out there. So I wasn't the only one like this growing up because there's a huge loneliness attached to growing up transgender and intersex, the generations that I was born because there was no real media or educational support systems for us to exist as who we were. We've always had to just lie about who we are and, binaryize ourselves and sort of you know flick to one end or the other of the spectrum Mm. so to not just feel free at last to be able to just you know be who I am and just dress and and date the people that I'm attracted to who are sort of more male and then to see society around me also opening up and doing the same thing and other people like me also living out their dreams at last was huge in itself but then to also then discover all this history that has been masked through mm. Hermaphrodite, through Aphroditus, and then the other histories that opened up around these intersex uh, and transgender-linked figures in antiquity 
just blew my mind because it meant that I wasn't inventing who I was anymore and being made to feel shamed for living out who I was. I was suddenly part of something much bigger Mm. that was being suppressed way beyond just me. Mm. I was being suddenly whirlpooled into an entire historical epic saga of transgender and intersex gods and human beings linked to them as clergies. But more than that, human beings that didn't go anywhere near those religious epicenters of trans and intersex figures, human figures, but that were still sort of dragged into these mythologies that were surrounding these intersex gods. So for me, it's been a total wake up call. And it's made me realize that actually a lot of history that we really have got to know about now that we've, you know, we've got to see in museums when we walk around them, we have to see these trans and intersex elements of history in the Greek and the Roman periods, particularly because to hide them is literally an act of cultural erasure, but it's more than that. It's actually the perpetuation of a a eugenics regime that really bubbled up to the surface in the ancient Greek and Roman empires, which of course are much more influential and important to our own culture than a lot of people would maybe realize or would like to admit. Our culture, our language, our traditions, at a seasonal level, all these different things, the way we view the world around us, the bubble that we're living in, is very, very much pivotal, pivotally centered on the Greek and the Roman empires. And unfortunately, their ethos is still echoing in our society today, I feel. So that's why I I started with the histories of hermaphrodite and hermaphroditis in Rome. And then that led me to, it literally led me to loads of different doors that were closed that then I started to open up. And I've just found the most unbelievable chronological just the most fascinating, I'm almost speechless actually when I think about everything that's gone on in history and everything that I've discovered. And so all this information that I've been researching over the last decade, um, sometimes feeling completely lonely in doing this because I've had to challenge, you know, certain very famous professors of classics. Mm. And I've been insulted, like you couldn't believe for doing this. And I've only ever wanted to release my own history and Mm -hmm. release the history of people like me because if we don't do this now what we're doing is we're cementing the most obscene unnecessary and evil erasure torture and massacre of transgender and intersex people who have no fault of their own for having been born like this none Mm -hmm. of us have It's the way we're born. Mm -hmm. So for me to sort of go to different educational institutions as I have and to be challenged in the way that I have by certain people there. I mean, I remember I've gone to one museum and I walked around, very famous museum, and I said to the curator, why do you not have any transgender and intersex gods on display? They're actually very important as part of the historical magnitude uh, the momentous wave of religious figures that existed in the Greek and the Roman empires and the you're washing away the middle ground why I don't understand you know like for example figures like hermaphrodite or or Sibylle or Agdistis or Phanes or there's loads and so this curator turned around to me and she said well um those bodies aren't really allowed to be seen by religious children and and they see they come to the museum Mm. and so at that point i sort of looked at this woman and i just thought so the whole museum institution in the uk and around the world all these museum institutions know what's going on really they know that trans and intersex gods were brought in in 204 BC into the Roman Empire during the Carthage Wars 
as a last resort because Rome was on its knees. They know that those gods, including Sibylle and Hermaphroditus, were then absorbed fully into the Roman Empire when Rome won the Carthage Wars because the Romans saw the victory in the Carthage Wars as being attributed to Sibylle, specifically Sibylle, and they saw that this intersex goddess who had been castrated in myths prior to even arriving in Rome and had been castrated by Dionysus who had drugged her and put a, a drug in her well and as she lay on the floor he tied a rope around her male genital because she was born intersex with both uh, male and female genitals down below and he and the other gods around him the male gods were told mm. found her scary and found her um, uncontrollable and wild so we're told in myths that came from Phrygia which is modern day Turkey that Dionysus then tied a rope around the male genital and when Agdysis then woke up uh, Agdysis as she's known in Phrygia and Greece but then when she was imported into Rome she was her name was sort of modified changed to Sibylle so when I say Sibylle I also really mean the continuum of goddesses that went that came before her like Agdysis it's the, her root and so when she then woke up and she had the rope around her, her her male genital she then ripped it off and we're then told in myths that the blood that fell to the ground then grew from that grew um, an almond tree in some versions of the myth it's a pomegranate tree and that a nymph came along and one of the um, almonds or pomegranates uh, was picked from the tree was put into nana was her name this um this particular nymph there's only different names of nymphs in, in Greek and Roman mythology. It's just like a whole, you know, encyclopedia. Mm. Um, and she put it into her bosom. And from that grew Agdistis Sibylle's child called Attis. Now, I just can't believe that museums do not have on display a proper and accurate historical, insightful, educational setup to explain to our society that particular story alone of Agdistis stroke Sibylle and the genital mutilation that she went through mm. that led to her child being born. And this is a very important child, Attis, because you see, Attis and Sibylle in Rome are very much, I believe, the precursors to the adoption and evolution of Jesus and Mary in the Roman Empire and then spreading across the whole of Europe and then of course around the world because then Christianity was spread across the world through colonialism. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. to ignore all these figures in museums and the educational syllabus is an, a criminal act of erasure of transgender and intersex individuals in, in, in antiquity and leading to the present day. Mm. Let me spin this round. If women, cis women or cis men who do enter the binary, who are part of this binary that is predominant but is not exclusive and, and it's this middle ground that we're sort of washing out and obviously it's this middle ground that proves that it's a spectrum Mm -hmm. and not a complete binary. If they had to go through what we've got to go through, transgender and intersex people, to go into a museum and see that there's no male statues there at all, or that there was no female statues there at all, even though they existed in antiquity, that in his own right is a cultural form of enslaving the modern day people that have to walk into that museum and not be allowed to see their own visual representations in, in antiquity. The mm -hmm. reason why I'm very passionate about this is because there's so much documented evidence from ancient writers, from also human beings in these cultures themselves that were became famous for having sort of either loved or hated trans and intersex gods and people that were linked to them. 
we can't hide all this anymore. You know, I mean, there are emperors who very publicly came out as either pro or against trans and intersex gods and people. Mm -hmm. We have got also people in the modern day, you know, museum curators who are specifically saying, no, I'm sorry, we can't see these statues or on a daily basis in these museums and show you people the, the truth that actually transgender and sex gods have existed and that they were completely decimated and broken down uh, mm. and then put under the carpet. If we don't allow people to see our own history, what's happening is that trans and intersex people in the modern age are being treated like chess pieces, like um, socio-political pawns that the mainstream which is the most populous and therefore really the most powerful because we're living in a de democratic society where majority rules and where debate rules. We are in the same position now if we don't enforce truth in museums, if we don't enforce an accurate, and you know, we've got to see an accurate view of the landscapes of antiquity if we don't see that, they're curating our past to make it look like it's black, white, binary, like all the gods and goddesses, oh, that's all that existed, it's just gods and goddesses. Mm. Hello? It's just such a fucking lie. I mean, <laughs> you couldn't get a, big, a bigger fucking lie if you tried, because, you know, something, the word hermaphrodite in itself is proof that there was even a, a word for a non-binary god in the ancient world right. you know the term itself etymologically it's the way it's constructed herm aphrodite so it's a combination of both the male father god and the female mother god together as one as the child but then beyond that go to greece ancient greece you know the word androgyny is a composite word to describe someone, an individual, who is a combination of both masculine, mm -hmm. feminine, male, female, mm -hmm. andro, Jenny. Mm -hmm. So there's not just historical evidence of ancient statues having trans and intersex myths, bodies, and cultural fames around them, cult, mm -hmm. you know, cults literally around them. Mm. There's also evidence of words, literary evidence of authors and specific word them themselves, you know, proving that this binary that we are still trapped in the middle of, mm. the, you know, transgender and sex people really today are still trapped in the middle of this because there are people supporting us and saying, you deserve to live equal human rights and, and have equal human rights to everybody else and live equal free lives. But then there's a huge other section of society that's saying the complete opposite. And, you know, they've now coined this phrase of gender critical. Um, and they sort of, I just can't believe actually the amount of people that are jumping on this ridiculous term, gender critical, and trying to give mm. it power and credibility when in actual fact, this word is a, is just a form of oppression. Mm. It's it's a, it's basically saying I'm putting my judge cap on, and I'm saying no, no, you don't exist. And the way people are you using this term, oh yes, I'm gender critical, like it's something to be proud of, and like they are suddenly standing up against a, a new dangerous fad that's being brought into you know our society today to sort of you know, and I, I hear people actually saying on social media, like, oh, God, you know, the state of the world, there are men who think they're women and fit women who think they're men. And they genuinely feel that they're pushing forward some new, modern, strong, important mm. movement, which is this gender critical movement, when in actual fact, the gender critical movement has been in existence for thousands of years. Do you know what I mean? I mean, we, gender critical movement in Rome saw men and women locking up trans and intersex people in temples if they entered the cult, the, um, the religious cult of Sibylle, to hide them away from society. 
Mm. Uh, gender critical ancient movements castrated Agatistus sensibly to fucking begin with. Mm. Gender critical ancient movements hid away hermaphrodite statues and actually physically modified them. I mean, you know, let's get real here. This is completely fucking insane. There are museums today who have statues that were intersex bodied that have been physically modified. I mean, how psychologically insane are we talking here? And thank wow. God one of them has come forward and admitted this, which is the Liverpool museums have been very moral about this. And on their website, they've actually got a whole article, which is 10% of the way there, if I'm honest with you, because the article that Liverpool museums has got on the website is not actually explaining to you the history behind the sleeping hermaphrodite statues mm -hmm. to begin with, but they are admitting that the statue they've got there is called, or has been called by previous curators, um, the sleeping Venus, but they have added on now stroke hermaphrodite mm. because that statue originally was intersex bodied and it was a hermaphrodite statue that had children around the breasts of the um, intersex figure uh, feeding from the breast because you see what people forget is that actually intersex gods in history were seen as figures of fertility and mm. of marriage and union so they were very important figures in, in certain uh, cultures in antiquity that became a real they, they basically became a real danger and a real threat to the sole totalitarian domination and ethos of heterosexual cis men and the patriarchy in control. You know, we need to really debate, I think, gender critical people because they seem to think that they're a modern, um, you know, force of morality and good that's um, fighting against you know this new trans and intersex craze that's dangerous and that's taking over the youth of today you know is what we're told and the truth is that gender critical people have been in existence throughout history and the painting behind me actually is evidence of that because there's a doctor who's quite well known uh, called Hippocrates and Hippocrates is very important because not only in modern day medicine do doctors swear on the Hippocratic Oath, what modern doctors are doing, I think, is that they're actually swearing today upon a whole bubble, an ideology that Hippocrates handed down to us and that ancient Greek and Roman societies who were driven by patriarchal orders grabbed with both hands because it gave them full power. Now, basically this painting is called the Hippocratic Corpus Gender Hierarchy. This for me is the most important and pivotal piece of evidence to prove, number one, gender critical dickheads have basically existed since the beginning of time, since recorded history, because Hippocrates is one of these gender critical people. He ordered the spectrum of humanity into six boxes. He did binary box the spectrum. He did think that there was this sort of line in the middle, but he did see that you could cross the line over. And what he said was there was three shades of male and three shades of female. However, the middle shades of male and female, he called androgenies. Okay, so this is this composite ancient word mm -hmm. that proves that non-binary figures and uh, identities have been, exist uh, been existent since early medical records began. Um, and so what Hippocrates did, being the gender critical pioneer that he was, was that he ordered the three boxes of male and the three boxes of female into an order of importance. Now, mm. there's six boxes. He ordered the sort of the male boxes to be the top ones, he saw the males as the, the, the most masculine males, uh, warrior males are at the very top. And mm. then he saw that the, he sort of inverted the male and female 
hierarchy of importance, social importance, because then what he did was he put the most feminine female at the top and the most masculine androgynous females at the very bottom again. So basically on both sides, the androgynies were at the very bottom of the importance scale. Oh, that's like. interesting. So it's not so like a scale of, yeah. Yeah. So essentially this hierarchy of importance that we're living out today still has been authored and cemented mm. by the most influential doctor physician in Western history. Mm. And this is something that no one really talks about in museums or shows you curators mm. very rarely show you the Hippocratic corpus gender hierarchy. So this is proof that not only did, were intersex and transgender people being documented in the middle of this biological spectrum, but they were also then being literally condemned to the bottom ranks mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is the proof. You can't deny this any longer, you know. Mm -hmm. And the problem is that the modern medical establishment and too many doctors are pinning their ideologies on Hippocrates mm -hmm. and his views of gender, his gender critical antiquitous views. So this is what we've got to now start talking about. And this is what we've got to now dismantle because the problem is that this, you know, hierarchy of importance created by toxic masculinity in the ancient world. And this structure has been underpinned by women as well so this isn't just men men it's their fault it's the heterosexual males that are the warriors it's them it's all them it's a whole mainstream male and female problem that has been whirlpooling around us since day dot and what we can't do anymore is sit down and accept what museum curators are telling us which is mm -hmm. oh you know it's fine we, we do show trans and intersex history oh, oh, we do show trans and intersex statues and bits but you know we just show them once a year during lgbti history month and you know mm. they're sort of wheeled in and shown to people and then they're wheeled out it doesn't work yeah. like that you can't wheel in sibylle she was an absolute pivotal part of the roman empire and its religious structure you can't wheel in and then wheel out hermaphrodite Hermaphrodite was a very important figure who was, yes, over time broken down in Rome, but there's lots of evidence that lots of emperors and lots of other leaders absolutely adored these gods and actually had them in their own gardens or houses at home. Or, for example, you know, um, Pompey actually had a statue or several statues of intersex and transgender gods in their theatre, which was very famous. Um, for example, Emperor Claudius celebrated the transition of who was uh, someone who was assigned female at birth, who was intersex, and then naturally in secondary stage puberty developed into more male, and they felt male, and they joined the army, and they became an, uh, a famous um, army general or I can't remember if it was an army general or someone important in the army. And when that person, when their story of how they had transitioned from the assigned female to male category and that they'd got married to a female and, you know, they'd take on this whole Roman male warrior role, when that information arrived at the court of Claudius, Claudius called that person up to the court and actually had commissioned an altar in their honour mm. because they saw their transition as something holy and something to be revered. Now, you know, look at the difference between someone like J.K. Rowling today saying things about trans men who she still regards as women um, and also intersex men who she still regards as women because they might have you know, what we would consider stereotypically female external phenotypical genitals. It's two polar ends of the, of the spectrum here, isn't it? We've got JK Rowling and her gender critical crowd saying, no, 
that person is just a woman. That's all they'll ever be. And yet you've got someone in antiquity who was an emperor who actually celebrated that particular transition of that person and said, no, you're a man. So gender critical is not new. Transgender and intersex people aren't new. And, you know, to be quite honest with you, the constant judgment and the constant debates about our existence, about who we are, about where we're allowed to go, about how we're allowed to consider ourselves, about how other people are allowed to define us, what pronouns people are allowed to call us, all these other things that gender critical people like JK Rowling and her crowd have whipped up around us. It's just such a mirror on the ancient Greek and Roman worlds, particularly Rome. And I'm disgusted to the core of my being that so many famous, important museum curators, historians, famous history celebrities are not saying anything about this, are treating people like me like we're mad, are telling us to pipe down, to calm down, that we're going over the top with this. Oh, yes, I've heard some, uh, someone say a very important uh, museum tell me, oh, yes, but you're going overboard about this, you know, they were just very minor characters that were just left to the side. No, they weren't. Sibylle and Hermaphrodite in Rome were big business and there was a huge following that they had. And so not only are we as human beings often being erased and told, no, shut up, you know, or sometimes being killed. I mean, let's be honest, you know, there's a lot of anti-us and there's a lot of... Um, disgust and hatred, um, aversion towards us, which is being whipped up all too often by religious leaders and religious books and mm. religious in, in general. So, you know, we can't sit down anymore and ignore what's going on. We've got to reclaim history. We've got to reclaim ancient trans and intersex people in the ancient world. And for me, really, more than anything, we've got to save lives in the modern day because there are too many intersex people in particular who are going through non-consenting genital operations. But more than that, there's a lot of intersex children and adults that have been forced onto hormones that have really damaged their health, um, that have given them brittle bones, that have increased their likelihood of cancer, that have done all these different things to their bodies to binaryize them into one or other of these Greco-Roman binary boxing categories that we're still obsessed with here in mm. you know mundane Europe so in Rome intersex children were being used like sort of non-binary gender bombs they were viewed as portents which means that some sort of big event was going to come as a sign it was a sign of something to come in the empire so this is the proof that you know in ancient early western Europe they definitely recognised more than just two categories of gender. Mm. And what I really find interesting is, like, if you go back to lots of ancient cultures, lots and lots of them, even beyond the Greek and the Roman empires, loads of them in Egypt, Persia, India, South Americas, Australasia, all these places where native cultures were in existence uh, and were thriving before European colonialism came in and destroyed it all and mm. enslaved them, all those ancient cultures did recognise a spectrum of humanity. They didn't just recognise the most masculine heterosexual males and the most feminine heterosexual females. They recognised most certainly that there were trans and intersex individuals in the middle and that some of them would actually cross over into male or female categories and do it very well and sometimes mm. be completely passable and you would never realize that someone wasn't born female or wasn't born male and also that they recognize that in the middle there were some of them were male some of them were female but some of them were intersex and that their identity and that their bodies were the middle ground the intersexual middle ground of this spectrum so now we've really got to support and champion museums like Oxford Museums because Oxford Museums is one of the most pioneering and brave museums out there actually because they are pushing forward the desperate need for honesty, 
in the way museums are being curated, not just at, at a racial level and not just at a, um, making sure that all the objects have the correct provenance, because provenance is very important now, and it should have been from the beginning. There's too many objects in museums that have been looted and snatched away and thieved. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, and there's too many g gaps, basically. There's, you know, there's definitely too many gaps in museums mm. where the trans and intersex items should be and mm. where they should be properly labelled and they should be, you know, these museums should be explaining to the public that, yes, actually trans and intersex individuals have existed since the dawn of time mm -hmm. and to you know to hide those like other museums do is just to turn their back on the pioneering work that oxford is doing right now and you know i need to applaud them because i've experienced so much rejection and criticism and judgment and um, censorship from other museums towards my art appearing mm -hmm. in the museums uh, and I've been lucky in that my artworks, my silver masks, my paintings, my oral art pieces, my video art pieces have been exhibited around the world in different places and also in very important museums in the UK. But they've only been dropped in and then they've been sort of washed out. Whereas in Oxford, when I brought them, my narratives, my artworks, I felt embraced for the mm. first time ever. And that's why I just absolutely adore Oxford because they actually already have a hermaphrodite statue there. And I wrote a thesis about the statue, giving the public a real background to the statue and the history that surrounded it in the Roman empire and also the Greek empires. And they've allowed us to start talking about the subjects whereas a lot of other museums were holding back were saying no we're being nervous and we're saying mm. no no religious children come to the museum we can't show you this information oxford took the reins and said come on let's let's show the people what this is about because the great thing about oxford is that they already had the statues there whereas a lot of other museums have banned them or have generously mutilated the statues and modified them completely to sort of you know, take people sent away from what was really going on with that particular statue and the history that surrounded it. Mm. Oxford did the complete opposite. They had the statues there already. They've got a Sibley statue. They've got Hermaphrodite statue. So, you know, this is a, a well-regarded museum that deserves an applause for what they're doing. And, you know, they've got, they did a, I did, I was part of a, an exhibition there and a, a permanent project, which is part of an app and a museum tour, which you can go on in Oxford, called Out in Oxford. Mm. And the tour is fantastic because it takes you around all of Oxford museums, all the different ones, on this app that you can download for free on your phone. And it takes you around all the different museums and gives you little kind of highlight stop-off points for all these different relics and objects and artworks that have an LGBTI narrative. And... Oh, the yeah. last one on the tour, which is sort of really crescendos in a way, in the Ashmolean Museum, and they've got a statue there of Hermaphrodite, Hermaphroditus. And so I wrote a thesis about it. And that has opened up a lot of doors because now there's another project that has, um, and also it was fantastic that we were nominated for an award. We were nominated for British Museum and Heritage Award which is brilliant. And so that has now led to another project that's happening in Oxford that I'm part of called Beyond the Binary. Mm. Now, Beyond the Binary is uh, really exciting because it's been funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund and it's been in development for a while, actually. And the people behind it are just absolutely incredible. What they're doing here is just such a hugely important resource for the transgender and intersex communities uh, around the world, not just in the UK, because they've allowed a whole group of artists um, and writers and intellectuals and academics to come together and to each one of us illustrate, bring to life, mm. coruscate the histories and modern day existence of transgender and intersex people 
Mm-hmm. And so my element that I'm bringing forward into this particular project is that they are exhibiting three of my silver masks that I've leased them for a year because this project is on for a year there, which is going to be brilliant. It's a free wow. project. So please do get down there because we need all the support we can get. And the Pitt Rivers Museum in Oxford is the host of this Beyond the Binary exhibition. Mm-hmm. And I'm just so grateful that we've got this fantastic platform in Oxford now because the three masks that I'm exhibiting are the mask of Phanis, the mask of Agdistis, and the mask of Hermaphroditus. I wanted to bring it back to the person, like the whole mask, uh, like what, what inspired that for you? Because you talked about unmasking, but obviously you're, yes. you're kind of masking as well. So there's a hiding and a revealing. What is behind that? Yeah, I mean, well, basically, from my own point of view, the reason why I wear masks is because uh, when I was younger, I've got problems with one of my eyes in that I had very bad eyesight. And um, I've got a a condition of the cornea, essentially. So they had to give me a cornea transplant and it went wrong. And um, I couldn't see out of the eye for over a year. And I was in a lot of pain. I was actually bed bound practically for a whole year in the dark. And I couldn't wear makeup on that eye for two to three years, the doctor said to me, because I was constantly having operations to try to get it going. I was really worried that I was going to lose the eye. It was just the worst time of my life. And then the doctor said to me afterwards, you, you can't risk it. You're not allowed to wear makeup in the eye for you know a good couple of years. And I'd only been really living out myself for about two to three years before this. So makeup for me was an important part of me going out in public because it it helped me to assimilate into who I am. And also it helped to give people, you know, the public around me, the knowledge that inside I'm feminine and I'm a girl. So it's a kind of expression of myself from the inside out. And I felt very, very depressed and isolated anyway through the whole eye operations period that mm-hmm. then I thought to myself, how do I, how do I turn all this round? You know, and I'd been looking at this whole history of insects and transgender gods and people for a long time anyway. And I thought, well, I'm being masked. People around me are being masked. Antiquity is being masked. Why don't I just start wearing masks, you know, and make this a mm. sort of sociopolitical metaphoric statement. Mm. So that's what I did. I started creating different masks and I was sort of created them as a half mask so that this eye was decorated, if you like. Mm. Um, and then three years later, I could wear makeup again. So I just thought, why not continue with this whole mask theme? Because actually, I don't know lots of people who make art orientated around masks. So I love the idea of doing it as a kind of unique niche in a way. Mm. And I thought, well, what better way of getting my art out there but wearing it? So for me, and because I'm really into fashion and I love fashion, I'm doing more and more work at the Royal College of Art as well as a as a speaker down there, as a tutor and um, creating other projects that I'm really excited about that I'm launching at the Royal College of Art soon as well. So for me, art is and fashion is something that I can combine together. And so from my point of view, my masks are, yes, a metaphorical symbol, but they're also a kind of fashion statement, if you like. And um, I actually really love them because when I go out in public, I always generate a big response from people. I mean, sometimes it's not a great response, but on the, on the whole, people are really lovely and nice. Mm. And I find that it's a really great sort of conversation starter. Mm. So in a way, I like harnessing that because to get your art out there, it's about learning how to harness conversations and publicize your work. So what other, you know, better way is there to publicize my work and to promote it than to wear it? Mm. So there's a big part of that. And also the reason why I choose silver particularly, and they're all hallmarked silver 999 masks, is because I'm sort of finding this middle ground between the black and the white Mm. of the gender binary that we've all, you know, been educated to believe is the only thing that exists in the world. Mm -hmm. And um, the silver, the the grey in the middle, 
is me. So it's mm. sort of a very accurate representation of what's happened in history and what's happening in the modern day. You know, trans and intersex people are being masked mm. and our histories are being masked. And we've got to now reveal all this and we've got to all together be fascinated and celebrate the history that has been banned, the human beings that have been banned, the gods that have been banned, and the spectrum of humanity which has been masked and that really does deserve now to be freed because there's child abuse that's happening, there's adult abuse that's happening. We can be a stronger, healthier, more productive, more beautiful world if we accept biology, if we accept history. Anthropology is not something that can be moved around uh, a board like a chess piece. Mm. And that's something that we cannot have concealed anymore. We need the educational syllabus. We need museums. We need the media, particularly state-funded media like the BBC, who I go to every single year with different famous production companies who take a, you know, a documentary idea that I've developed or something to them. And every single year we get through the same sort of, yes, we're interested, okay. And then the last minute, no, it's too niche. Or no, mm. it's not for us. Or yeah, yeah. no, we can't yeah, have yeah. that. We've mm. got to have transparency, honesty, protection. We can't keep falling back into this, you know, Hippocratic corpus gender hierarchy. It's mm. got to fuck off. <laughs> yeah amen, amen to that yeah no i just i would just love to say thank you for talking to me about all this thank uh, you thank you for inviting me on i would love that you can find out more details on the website at 50 shades of gender.com forward slash ella which is e-l-a where you can also read the transcript thank you for listening to the 50 shades of gender podcast you can find us online at 50 shades of gender.com and on social media if you'd like to support us, please consider becoming a patron on Patreon. Plans start from only $1 a month. Visit patreon.com forward slash 50 shades of gender for more details. We hope you will listen again. Until then, stay curious and open-minded.